The great German car manufacturer, BMW, can trace its origins back into the last century. In the 1930s, it built some of the world's best sports and luxury cars. It recovered from destruction in World War II and financial reversal in the 50s. By the early 70s, it was once again a major factor in the world high performance and luxury market. was first registered in March 1916 by a company that manufactured aircraft engines. It would continue to manufacture them into the 1930s and make a major contribution to Adolf Hitler's development of superior military technology. The company's first major success was a Max Fritz designed six cylinder inline engine that powered German fighters in World War I. German aces Ernst Udet and Manfred von Richthofen, the Red Baron, owed much of their success to BMW engines. After the war, the Treaty of Versailles banned the production of aircraft engines in Germany. BMW turned to agricultural machinery. But the genius of Max Fritz continued to make its mark. His six-cylinder BMW aircraft engine was part of a winning tradition. It also designed the engine that won the 1914 French Grand Prix for Mercedes. In 1919, his six-cylinder BMW aircraft engine powered a DFW biplane on an amazing flight which reached an altitude of 32,000 feet. Meanwhile, the BMW name had been sold to another company which intended to produce brakes for railway carriages. It was bought back by one of BMW's original investors and in 1923, the reconstituted BMW released the revolutionary R32 motorbike. The R32's twin cylinder engine was designed by Max Fritz. Power was transferred at the rear wheel by a shaft rather than a chain. The R32 set the pattern for the classic BMW motorbike. In 1924, BMW entered the R32 in competition. Success was immediate. BMW wanted to produce its own cars, but it did not want to rival the large Daimler Benzes of the time and decided on something small. The Eisenach Dixie Company was producing a German version of the popular British Austin 7 under license. BMW decided to take over the Eisenach Dixie Company. It raised the money, and in late 1928, the little 315 Dixie with its tiny 750cc engine and 47 miles an hour top speed became BMW's first car. BMW had been in debt before raising money for the Dixie takeover. The Dixie company itself had hidden debts. But sales of the tiny Dixie were good. In Britain, the low price of the Austin 7 had brought car ownership within reach of a new part of the market. In Germany, the Dixie did the same thing. And it was just the car for the depression. It sold in thousands. The Dixie was very basic transportation. 
but it gave BMW a start in the world of four wheels. Many Dixie owners tuned their tiny cars for competition on the racetrack. Competition successes in the humble Dixie foreshadowed BMW's distinguished record in motorsport. The Allies dropped the ban on German aircraft engines in 1922, and 10 years later, BMW engines powered a Dornier flying boat on a record-breaking round-the-world flight. BMW had moved into car manufacture and was once again building aircraft engines, but it had not forgotten motorbikes. The R2 motorbike continued the BMW pattern of horizontally opposed twin engines and shaft drive. But a new factor was about to affect BMW's fortunes. By the time Hitler came to power in 1933, BMW had withdrawn from the agreement with the British Austin Company to produce the German version of the Austin 7. It had attempted, without great success, to produce a small car of its own design. But it had also developed a six-cylinder engine, and in the first year of the Nazi regime, it produced its 303 sedan. Hitler was more interested in aircraft than cars, and BMW's successful aircraft engines attracted his support. BMW radial engines powered the successful Junkers Ju-52 transport aircraft. BMW cars were manufactured at Eisenach, Aircraft engines were built at Munich. The staff of the Munich factory increased from 2,800 in 1932 to 12,500 in 1934. Cars were not as politically important as aircraft engines, but development of BMW automobile technology was rapid. BMW's first sports car, the 315-1, had the six-cylinder of the sedans, fitted with three Solex carburetors. Its elegant styling underlined BMW's seriousness about performance. BMW guaranteed that this car could exceed 75 miles an hour. The 315 two-seater was built in 1935 and 1936. Only 242 were produced, but they set the pattern for the great BMW cars that were to follow. Not all BMWs were elegant sports machines. The 319 sedan produced between 1935 and 1937 was a practical family car. But BMW was moving toward the top end of the market. This is the handsome 326 Cabriolet of 1936. The classic body styling of the 326 made it the major attraction of the 1936 Berlin Motor Show. It was not intended to be a sports car. It was designed to appeal to Mercedes customers. It was the most successful BMW of the 30s. 
and a total of almost 16,000 were sold between 1936 and 1941. The 326 offered its buyers hydraulic brakes, torsion bar rear suspension, newly designed independent front suspension, and a strong box frame, which replaced the previous BMW sedan chassis. It was available in open and closed versions and had an excellent top speed of around 70 miles an hour. BMW was not slow to use the reputation of their successful aircraft engines to promote their cars. Von der unbedingten Zuverlässigkeit der Motoren hängt die Sicherheit des Fluges ab. Es sind BMW Motoren. Die große Erfahrung der bayerischen Motorenwerke kommt auch den Motoren der BMW Kraftwagen zugute. Hochwertig, sicher und zuverlässig. Das sind die Merkmale des BMW Motors. So ist der BMW Wagen zum klassischen Fahrzeug geworden. Auf endloser Straße, im fahrtlosen Gelände, bei sportlichem Einsatz und im täglichen Gebrauch. Immer und überall versehen BMW Wagen mit vorbildlicher Zukunft. In the late 30s, a confusing variety of engine and body combinations was available to the market. The 320 and later 321 were both shorter and lighter two-door versions of the 326. But they were different from each other. All were beautifully finished, well-engineered cars. But while BMW was achieving success with its family and luxury range, it had developed a new model that would become the greatest BMW classic of the 30s. B.M.V. When the 328 was released in 1936, its impact on the sporting car public was immense. Its styling was a development of the 315-1 sports car. It was powered by the BMW 2-liter engine, fitted with a high-performance aluminum cylinder head. You could buy the 328 with a choice of gearboxes for the road or for competition. And there was also a choice of knockoff or bolted wheels. Top speed was close to 90 miles an hour. The light tubular chassis allowed suspension to be relatively soft and yet still give excellent handling. For the remainder of the 30s, the BMW 328 was a benchmark in sports car design. In post-war years, it became a classic, sought after by collectors and classic car racers. For many BMW enthusiasts, it remains the high point of the company's history. Elegant styling was a feature of the whole range of late 30s cars. The 327 was among the best looking of all the BMWs. It was a two-door sports version of the earlier 326. The 327 was released in 1937.
This is actually a 327-28, a high-performance version with a two-liter engine of the 328 sports car. By the late 30s, BMWs were strongly identified with the affluent end of Nazi German lifestyle. As well as engine options, the 327 offered the possibility of specialist coach work. If you wanted it, you could order one of many coach-built bodies in coupe or cabriolet style. There were many detailed differences between models. The 321's doors were hinged at the back, like its larger cousin, the 326. The 327, on the other hand, had doors hinged at the front. Almost every taste could be satisfied by the BMW range, as long as you had the money. But while BMW continued to pour out its beautifully designed and engineered cars, the industrial might of Germany was being harnessed to build the instruments of war. Companies like BMW were an essential component of Germany's plan to arm itself better than any potential enemy. By 1939, BMW was working on a wide variety of high-tech military projects, including the development of jet and rocket engines for aircraft. But steel from the German furnaces was still available for car manufacture, and BMW had one last pre-war design to come, the last of its classic line of 30s cars. The 335 was released in 1938. It had a three and a half liter engine and was a luxurious successor to the 326. It remained in production until 1941 and became a great favorite of high ranking military officers. It was not a car for the masses. Just over 400 were built. The declaration of war in 1939 was the beginning of the end for BMW as it had developed over its first decade as a car manufacturer. BMW cars continued to be built, but the design and development resources of the company were diverted to the war effort. The level of manpower controlled by BMW expanded enormously. Much of this increase came from prison and concentration camps. The company's expertise in aircraft engine production became a major factor in the Luftwaffe's technical superiority. The great Focke Wolf 190 fighter was one of many German aircraft powered by BMW. Success attracted the attention of the Allies. BMW's Munich factory was bombed around the clock in one day in July 1944, almost 12,000 bombs hit one BMW factory. When the war ended, the damaged Munich factory began again from scratch, producing pots and pans made from scrap aluminum. BMW went back to its origins, the motorbike, and by 1948 was ready to release its first post-war road machine, the R24. The original BMW car factory at Eisenach was now out of reach in Soviet East Germany. And it would be 10 years from the end of the war until BMW was allowed to rebuild their aircraft engine plant. In the meantime, BMW motorbikes became the mainstay of the company's return. They were successful on the road and on the racetrack. The Deutsche Bank arranged the financing necessary to bring BMW back to life. There was no sign of a new car yet, but the R24 motorbike proved to be a winner.
The R-24 was followed by the R-51. Like the R-24, it was a direct descendant of the original BMW motorbike. They shared the basic BMW characteristics, a twin-cylinder horizontally opposed engine and shaft drive. After the devastation of the war, resuming the production of BMW motorbikes had been difficult enough, but picking up the evolutionary threads of BMW cars would be much harder. A decade and a way of life had passed since the BMW 328 dominated the sports car world, but its technology was still usable, and several German enthusiasts set about building their own cars using the 328 as a basis. Among them was Ernst Luf. In the late 40s, Luf developed a highly sophisticated series of sports cars around BMW 328 components. He called his range of cars BMW Veritas. The Veritas cars were built for both the racetrack and the road. They were extremely successful in German road racing in the late 40s and early 50s and evoked strong memories of the great pre-war sporting tradition established by BMW. The surviving Veritas cars are now great collectibles. Ernst Luf, their designer, returned to work for BMW in the 50s to help re-establish the car-making side of the company. But by the beginning of the 50s, the first BMW post-war car was still two years away, and the main production output of the factory continued to be motorbikes. Initially, motorbikes and sidecars were just right for an economy in which few could afford cars, even if they were available. BMW motorbikes appeal strongly to young Germans trying to rebuild their lives after the war. Motorbike and sidecar combinations also had the advantage of providing spectacular racing for a public hungry for distraction and amusement. While BMW continued to dominate post-war German motorbike racing, argument continued inside the company about what kind of car to produce. It did not seem logical simply to pick up the pieces that had been dropped in 1941. Conditions had changed too much. A small car prototype, a step up from the motorbike and sidecar idea, was built but rejected. Directors favored a car that would measure up to BMW's pre-war luxury reputation. It was a strange commercial decision, given the economic reality of the time. The market for such a car had virtually disappeared. The BMW factory in Munich was still largely a motorbike production facility. When a prototype for the new luxury car was shown in April 1951, there was really no means of mass producing it. BMW made a momentous decision. The company would invest all its available capital in building its own pressed steel stamping plant, which would take several years to complete. A new facility was developed incorporating modern post-war work practices and technology. While the plant and all its support systems were being built, bodies for the new car would be contracted out to the coachwork company Bauer in Stuttgart. It was a grand idea even though the new car was in fact little more than a revision of the pre-war 326. Progress was slow, 
18 months would pass between the showing of the prototype and the delivery of the first cars from the factory. There was no question of producing a new engine. All technology would have to be adapted. The new luxury car would be heavy, almost 3,000 pounds, but BMW had to use the pre-war two-liter six-cylinder engine to power it. The factory was equipped to produce motorbike engines. Tooling up to produce an old car engine would be a major expense. For now, a new engine was impossible. With only 65 horsepower available for such a heavy body, no one expected performance to be outstanding. But BMW saw the old engine as only a short-term solution. Engineers were designing a 3.2-liter V8 with a power output double that of the old six. The major investment in new plant, equipment, and personnel was a risky move. If the decision to build a luxury car was wrong, the company faced the possibility of financial ruin. The post-war German economic miracle was beginning, but for BMW workers, there was a chance it could be over very quickly. The new BMW luxury car was called the 501. It entered production in October 1952. The body had generous flowing lines. Its many compound curves would eventually be pressed out of sheet steel in the BMW factory. But for a while, all the bodies would come from the Bauer coachworks. The price tag of the new car would be high. It was set at 15,000 Deutschmarks, 50 times the monthly wage of the workers building it. Many Germans didn't like the Baroque Angel, as it was nicknamed. They called it fat and said it looked too much like the contemporary British Austin designs. They were also critical of BMW for putting a weak elderly engine into such a bulky car. In spite of all the early criticism, the BMW buying public liked the 501. Cars trickled out of the factory. In 1952, only 50 were delivered, but production gradually increased and eventually the 501 sold well. The 501 was underpowered, but it wasn't slow. It had a top speed of 85 miles an hour. Acceleration was another matter. It took over half a minute to reach 60. A series of engine improvements was made through the production life of the car. It was given a 12-volt electrical system, a dual downdraft Solex carburetor, and a new camshaft were added. A new ZF gearbox was installed. Top speed was increased, but reliability reduced. BMW's already stretched financial situation was stretched even further by the number of repairs it had to make to these cars under guarantee. The real revolution occurred when the V8 engine at last became available and the 501 model was replaced by the 502. The long-awaited new engine was Germany's first high-volume alloy V8. Initially, it produced 95 horsepower, but output was increased throughout its life. This is a 1954 502. 
It was a beautifully made luxury car with top speed now approaching 100 miles an hour. And finally, acceleration to match. Sales began to increase, and in 1955, BMW launched two new cars that had the potential to elevate the company to its pre-war status. The sporty 503 signaled a return to high-performance cars in the tradition of the 315 and 328. It had a top speed of 118 miles an hour, but was not a big seller. Neither was the 507, but it was by far the most desirable car that BMW had produced since the 30s. BMW's gamble in producing low-volume luxury cars was not paying off, and motorbike sales, which had kept the company going, were dropping as the population became more affluent. People who owned neither motorbike nor car relied on public transport. As the German economic miracle developed and disposable incomes grew, buying a car became more than a dream for a larger and larger section of the population. But for most buyers, a small, cheap car was the only realistic, if uncomfortable, possibility. Klappt es, er fährt los, doch fühlt er schmerzhaft jeden Stoß. In 1955, BMW went right to the opposite extreme from its luxury V8s and offered the buying public just about the smallest car possible. No more problems finding parking spaces and no more damage trying to fit into one that was too small for the car. In the new BMW, parking was as simple as it can get. The Isetta, as it was called, belonged to a class known in the 50s as the bubble car. It was designed by an Italian refrigerator manufacturer, Renzo Revolta, and BMW was one of several companies that built it under license. It really could be driven straight into a tiny parking space, and many who could only afford to look at the luxury V8s could actually buy an Isetta. BMW sold 160,000 of them. Later models had a 600cc BMW motorbike engine. Ironically, this strange little car helped BMW survive. It provided the volume sales the company needed to build its new sporty 700 series. Der Wagen mit Profil, BMW LS Luxus. Groß, großartig zu fahren, größter Komfort. The 700 was released in 1959 and remained in production in several different versions until 1965. Luxus, der Wagen mit Profil. Its 700 cc motorbike engine was only slightly larger than that of the 600 bubble car but it looked like a real car and found a steady stream of buyers. In standard form, the 700's engine produced 30 horsepower. Sports versions were tuned to give 10 more, and in a small light body, performance was surprisingly good. A few mid-engined competition roadsters were even included among the various forms of the 700 and they competed with success in a class of racing where the competition could be, to say the least, intense.
The 700 was a very important BMW. Although it didn't make a fortune for the company, it paid its way. BMW researchers identified the need for a slightly larger car to fill the gap between the 700 and the luxury tours. But the company's planners argued about just what kind of car they should build. In the meantime, the company nearly went broke. In 1959, large BMW stockholders pressed for the acceptance of a low-priced Daimler-Benz takeover bid. But BMW dealerships and the smaller shareholders resisted. Financiers Herbert and Harold Quant acquired a large parcel of stock. Herbert Quant pressed for the production of a car aimed at Germany's growing middle class. The success of the 700 bought time to allow the company to set up for the production of that new car. If it hadn't been for the cheeky little 700, there might well be no BMW today. The company could not have held out against the takeover threats, nor could it have afforded the tooling to develop the new mid-range car that would form the basis of BMW's next generation. It was essential to BMW that the new car, the 1500, be ready for release at the Frankfurt Motor Show in the autumn of 1961. It was not yet ready for production, but BMW felt that it had to be shown to interest potential customers. The 1500cc four-cylinder engine was well developed, but there was conflict between the development engineers and the sales department about the look of the new car the sales department prevailed. The Italian stylist Michelotti was asked to incorporate the traditional BMW kidney-shaped grille into the new front bodywork. The chassis, bodywork, and running gear were developed in haste, but the 1500 made the deadline. It was a great success at the show. Thousands were ordered, but there were problems in getting it into immediate mass production. A preliminary series was produced in February 1962, but full production didn't begin until October. Only 2,000 were built in the year, against 20,000 orders placed by the end of 1961. The 1500 was a new beginning for BMW. It was known within the company as the New Series, or New Range. It offered very sporty road performance and was a natural for competition. Another major feature of the 1500 was that it removed BMW for the time being from head-on competition with Mercedes. The 1500 engine set the pattern for the modern BMW. It was designed for high-speed cruising. It could run at speeds approaching 100 miles an hour on the Autobahns and only cost half as much as the 502 V8s. Its clean styling and excellent road manners hit the middle-class market niche dead center. At last, 17 years after World War II, this was the car that would save the company. As the 1500 success continued, BMW began to drop its older and less profitable models. The little Isetta was dispensed with in 1962. The 501 and 502 V8s went out of production in 1963. The four-cylinder 1500 engine was designed to accept high-performance tuning. It was also designed to be stretchable. It was planned that after the initial market period of the 1500, the engine would be enlarged to 1.8 and then 2 liters. The 1.8 liter version, called the 1800, was introduced in 1963. Externally, only a chrome strip and a badge gave away the difference. 
BMW's sports-minded engineers had more in store. At the same time, the high-performance TI for Touring International was introduced with high compression, an extra carburetor, and various other performance options. And there was much more to come. Over the next 10 years, until the early 1970s, many different versions of this basic line of cars would be offered to satisfy all tastes in BMW's new sector of the market. One of the most important variations from the basic model was the two-door line of cars. This is an 1802 from 1971. The two-door cars were substantially lighter than their four-door counterparts, and they made a great impact on buyers interested in high performance. Development continued. The 2000 range, with a two-liter version of the four-cylinder engine, came into the market in 1966. The new BMWs changed the traditional notion of a sports car. They were engineered to outperform most of the two-seater roadsters of the 60s, and yet they looked like normal sedans. Eventually, the 2000 became available in a fuel-injected version, the TII, released in 1969. It had a top speed of 115 miles an hour. The two-door 2002 came out in 1968. Road testers raved about it, and it quickly became a cult item. The great American dealer in European cars, Max Hoffman, championed BMW for a long time, and the two-door cars vindicated his faith in BMW's American potential. But the American versions of the 2002 lacked the punch of their less regulated European counterparts. While the line of cars that saved BMW had four-cylinder engines, the company's tradition of six cylinders, dating back to the 30s, was not forgotten. Motorcycle production continued, but cars were now dominant, and among the new products of BMW's rapidly developing technology was a new line of six-cylinder cars, the BMW 2500s. The four-cylinder cars had started with the 1500 engine, which was designed to be easily expanded to larger capacities. The same principle was adopted for the six-cylinder cars. Increasing demand led to a period of change and expansion. New factories were taken over and renovated. Motorcycle production was moved to Berlin. The company, almost bankrupt less than 10 years ago, was rapidly expanding. The six-cylinder cars were offered in four-door sedan and two-door coupe form. The 2.8 and 3-liter coupes are among BMW's most handsome cars of the 70s. The six-cylinder sedans and coupes expanded the market reach of BMW. Their introduction meant that once again, BMW was competing with its old rival, Mercedes. As the wealth of the German middle class increased, BMW pitched its cars to a widening economic spectrum. By the time the three-liter CSI was introduced in 1971, the company was once again setting out to appeal to the top end of the market. The elegant three-liter CSI once again positioned BMW in the market sector they had occupied so successfully in the 30s with cars like the 327. The CSI had a six-cylinder engine. It had high performance and a price tag to match. BMW had come full circle since World War II. The company had risen from the ashes of the war and endured a period of uncertainty and adversity. With success had come an opportunity to return to the old principles of excellence and high performance. 
In the early 70s, BMW began to build a new office block in Munich, symbolizing its return to a dominant position in the German motor industry. The building was designed to utilize high technology construction methods. It was built in the shape of four cylinders. In 1972, with BMW developing its third generation of post-war cars, the building was completed. From its position of prosperity in the early 70s, BMW could look back over the brilliant cars that saved the company, the great misguided cars that nearly ruined it, and beyond the devastation of the war, to the elegant coupes and roadsters that had set a standard for excellence in the 30s. From the 315, BMW's first sports car, and the little Austin 7 base Dixie that began it all, BMW had come a long way. <laughs>